Hello, I'm Mark Dunkelman. Thank you for joining me for Adventures of a Civil War Historian. And thanks to Mike Movius and the Civil War Roundtable Congress for inviting me to share some stories with you. I have had three lifelong passionate pursuits, making art, studying Civil War history and playing music in no particular order. From the third grade, I was the class artist. And so art seemed to be the direction I was heading in. But from a very early age, I was fascinated by Civil War history. Here's a picture of me around age 13, showing off some of my artwork. Love to draw horses. And there is General Sherman with his, some of his generals on the wall. And what got me started in fascination with Civil War history were stories that my father and my aunt told me about growing up on the family farm in Ellicottville, New York, with their parents and their maternal grandfather, John Longhans, a veteran of the 154th New York Volunteer Infantry. And my dad told me these stories, which captivated me. At one point, he bought an, brought an old reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder home from his office. And I sat him down, and I asked him questions. And years before I heard the term oral history, I transcribed this interview I made with my father. This was probably during the years of the Civil War centennial which were concurrent with my high school years, 1961 to 1965. Now, in addition to the stories my father told me of Grandpa Longhans marching with Sherman to the sea, were relics that the family had saved. And here they are laid out, kept them in a box. They soon became my possessions because I was so interested in them a hardtack, some acorns he had picked on Lookout Mountain, ribbons he wore at regimental reunions, the buttons from his Grand Army of the Republic coat, a couple photographs of him and the rest of Ellicottville, New York's Grand Army of the Republic post on long ago Memorial Days. And my interest soon grew beyond that of just my great grandfather to that of his regiment as a whole. What was this 154th New York? What, what was their experiences during the war? And I determined to study as much as I could. I began collecting Civil War books. Uh, the memoirs of General William Tecumseh Sherman was a present for my 10th birthday or Christmas. I started saving my allowance money and purchased the autobiography, two volume autobiography of Oliver Otis Howard and started to tra trace every mention I could of this regiment or the brigade or division or corps that they belonged to. And I determined to write a history of the 154th New York. And I set a goal for myself. I would do so before I reached the age of 50 years old. I was a baseball fan, Duke Snyder of the Brooklyn Dodgers, my idol. And my wife and I happened to be coming back from a visit to her brother, who was at Ithaca College, heading back to our home in Providence, Rhode Island in 1970 on my birthday in 1970, as a matter of fact, and we decided to stop at the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. But when we got there, we discovered that there was an entrance fee. I forget how much it was. It was modest, but we needed the money for gas to get back home. So we passed on the, we passed on the Hall of Fame and drove a little farther down the road in Cooperstown and we came to the New York State Historical Association. 
and they had a library there. And I said, I want to stop here. And we did. And we went in to the library. And I got the most astonishing 23rd birthday present I could have imagined. Because in their collection was a master's thesis that had written, been written a few years before, three years before, submitted by a fellow named Michael J. Whiney. And it was called the Hardtack Regiment, History of the 154th Regiment, New York State Volunteer Infantry in the Civil War. Now, I thought I was the only person in the entire face of the planet studying this particular regiment. But lo and behold, here was a, a trained professional historian who shared my interest and had written about it. And I looked through Mike's thesis and I realized that he had found some sources that were new to me and vice versa. I had sources that he was unaware of. And so I contacted, eventually contacted Mike. He was then working for the Pennsylvania Museum and Historical Commission in Harrisburg and proposed that we collaborate on a history of the 154th New York. And Mike agreed. Uh, he eventually, a, a year or two after we connected, got his, what he called his dream job and became curator of special collections at the US Army Military History Institute at Carlisle Barracks, Pennsylvania, where he oversaw the largest collection of Civil War photographs in the country. And so by prearrangement, I, I had uh, the good fortune to be able to go to Western New York every summer to Cattaraugus and Chautauqua counties. And I had a hunch that a legacy might be found there. And so in 1973, I made my first trip to uh, Cattaraugus and Chautauqua, first of many. As a matter of fact, I've been there annually every year since, aside from 2020 when the COVID-19 pandemic kept me away. And I learned that it paid to advertise. So I planted stories in local newspapers. This one appeared in the Olean Times Herald on July 21st, 1973. And in essence, I announced that I was planning to write a history of the regiment. And I asked for people to uh, share materials with me. And within days of the first newspaper article appearing, I got a letter from a woman named Peggy Whitcomb, who said that she had a number of letters written by her great uncle, Harvey Earl, but they terminated before the Battle of Gettysburg and the family didn't know what happened to him. And I was able to inform Peggy that Harvey Earl, Earl was captured at the Battle of Gettysburg and died as a prisoner of war at Andersonville in Georgia. Well, after several years of gathering materials in Western New York, Mike Whiney and I got together and using his thesis as the skeleton we flushed fleshed out uh, the history with accounts by members drawn from their letters and diaries that I had turned up. And in 1981, our history of the 154th New York, the Hardtack Regiment was published. What is the history of the 154th New York? I'll give you the, th the thumbnail sketch. Organized in the summer of 1862, assigned to the Army of the Potomac, to the 11th Army Corps, overwhelmed in their first battle, their baptism of fire at Chancellorsville, when they made a forlorn stand against Stonewall Jackson's famous uh, flank attack, surprise flank attack on the evening of May 2nd, 1863, where they lost 40%, the fourth highest Union regimental casualty count in the Army of the Potomac. 
Two months later at Gettysburg, overwhelmed again, losing 78%, most of them captured in another forlorn attempt to cover the retreat of the 11th Army Corps, transferred to the Western Theater, helped to open the famous Cracker Line to uh, besiege Chattanooga, Tennessee, took part in the Battle of Chattanooga, made a hard and harsh trip to the relief of besieged Knoxville, Tennessee, spent winter camp at Lookout Valley in the spring of 1864, took part in the Atlanta campaign, losing approximately 50% during a string of battles, March with General Sherman from Atlanta to Savannah and then up through the Carolinas and took part in the grand review of the Union armies at the conclusion of the war. I always like to point out that that's me on the left and my late partner, Mike Whining. It was a great partnership. Um, this was the only book we wrote together, but we continued our interest and shared materials. And our collections, our Mike's portion of our collection is, is housed at St. Bonaventure University in Cattaraugus County since Mike's passing in January of 2012. And my stuff will eventually join his there. Here are the two of us at Coster Avenue by the 154th Monument in Gettysburg. Incidentally, that's my mural in the background, 80 foot mural that's on a warehouse wall there. Again, sort of uh, combining my two interests of Civil War history and artwork. And here's Mike and I at the Seneca Theater in Salamanca, New York. Salamanca is the largest city, I do believe, on Native American land. It's on the uh, Seneca's Allegheny Reservation. And we were here for one of our annual reunions, the 25th annual reunion in August 2010 of descendants of the 154th New York. Now, since the Hardtack Regiment was published, I've had the good fortune to publish five more full length books dozens of articles, more than connect with more than 1300 descendants who have shared with me some 1700 letters, 26 diaries, photos of more than 280 members of the regiment and a room full of other materials. It is the largest collection of source material and publications on any single Civil War regiment. And what follows are some examples of occurrences in my decades of work that seem magical, if not divinely ordained. So these are my adventures. Here I am in Allegheny, New York, during one of my summer research trips in Cattaraugus County. And seated on the porch is Kitty Reeler. That's her daughter, Margaret Warren, at their home on North 4th Street in Allegheny. And this is in August of seven, uh, 1977. Now, Kitty Reeler was the daughter of a member of the 154th New York. She was in her 90s when I met her. And here is her father. Ash Bell Bozard, a private of company, company C in the 154th New York. Here he's pictured as a corporal after he re-enlisted in the 188th New York, after he was discharged from the 154th. So Kitty had these, she had two tintypes of her dad, of her father, and his diary. And my wife and I, took photographs of the photos. And we were about to leave when Kitty said, hold on, I've got something else I want to show you. 
and she herself climbed the stairs to her attic and came down holding this. A photograph of 16 veterans of the 154th New York at their monument in Gettysburg. It was the first photograph I had ever seen of a group of veterans at the monument. And Kitty pointed to the fellow in the light colored hat and said, that's my father. And I pointed to the man on his left with the GAR hat and said, that's my great grandfather. It was an astonishing moment. Now I must add that in the years since, I've come to question if that indeed is my great grandfather because I've discovered in photographs of the veteran that he had a sort of look-alike comrade. And it's sometimes hard to tell the two of them apart. Well, we took the photograph out of the frame so we could get a non-glare copy prints of it. And there I am holding on to it, happy as can be. It was a truly astonishing moment. And I had so many similar great occurrences uh, during the research for my book, met so many wonderful people. And to all the 154th descendants who might hear this, I can't thank you enough for really uh, fulfilling my dream to resurrect this story of our ancestors and what they did during the Civil War. Now, after the uh, Hardtack Regiment came out, I, uh, that the following summer, I went to Western New York to publicize the publication of the book. And this is an article that appeared in the Salamanca Republican Press. And as we were driving down from my aunt's house up in Buffalo, my aunt Flores, uh, to Salamanca for my interview for this newspaper article, my aunt Flores, my wife Annette, my sister Amy Dunkelman Rowland, and myself, and on the way to Salamanca, we decided to stop in Ellicottville to see the old farm where Aunt Flores and my dad grew up at the foot of the Jackman Hill Road outside of Ellicottville, the village of Ellicottville. Here's a picture of it. And the family that had bought the farm from our family in 1931 was still living there husband and wife team, Leonard Aldro and his wife. And Leonard, of course, remembered my Aunt Flores, and he actually remembered me from visits we had made, my dad and I had made during my childhood. And as a matter of fact, I asked Leonard, gee, you know, one time we were down here and uh, visiting you, and you had just had a two-headed calf born that day. And I remember lying it on it, this little calf lying on the grass outside of their kitchen. Leonard said, oh, I still have it. If you want to see it, it's up in the cow barn. Uh, moths have kind of got to it, but it's still up there. And then I asked Leonard, how about a musket? My dad always said that his, grand, his grandfather's musket was a, around the farm. And Leonard Aldrow said to me, well, I never saw a musket, but uh, come here with me. And he took me to this smaller barn, the horse barn. And we went inside this barn and it was full of stuff, a lot of farm machinery, all sorts of stuff. And Leonard Aldrow told me, when I bought this place from your family, I put all the stuff they left behind in here. And he went over into a corner and rummaged for a, around for a while. And he came out with this. An Enfield rifled musket bayonet. It could only have belonged to one person, my great grandfather, Corporal John Longhans, Company H, 154th New York Volunteers. 
So I made a deal with Leonard and left with the bayonet. Paid him a few bucks, which was all he wanted. I think he would have given it to me. And as we were leaving, he told me, you know, there's a, a leather box around here somewhere too. Couldn't put his hands on it on that occasion. And of course I was thinking, hmm, leather box could be a cartridge box or a cap pouch. And I made a point to go back down to the farm the next time I was in Western New York. And when I got down there, the Aldros were no longer on the farm and the horse barn had been cleared out. So if indeed my great grandfather's cartridge box was in that horse barn, its whereabouts are unknown, but at least I came away with a bayonet. And in 1986, when I held the first reunion, I had to call it a gathering actually, because we hadn't, hadn't uh, met before on that occasion. We had the first gathering of 154th New York descendants, July 26, 1986. And one of the descendants, a fellow named Gary Rhodes, who lived in Great Valley, New York, brought along his ancestor's Enfield rifle. And I happened to have the bayonet with me. So we put the bayonet on the rifle and I got to pose for a picture with the two of them together. Here's a detail of Frank Crick's Enfield musket. And you can notice a crescent and a star carved into the stock. Those of course were the badges of the 11th and 20th Army Corps to which the 154th New York belonged. Here is Franklin Crick, Gary Rhodes' ancestor. He was a good soldier. He was hospitalized at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg, but he was there at Chancellorsville, Chattanooga, the Atlanta campaign, all the way to the end of the war all through its service. Now, my next adventure concerns this soldier, Byron A. Johnston. He was a veteran of the 37th New York who, after that regiment was mustered out, joined the 154th New York and became, he, he was mustered in as a first sergeant and was promoted to second lieutenant, first lieutenant, and eventually captain of Company F. And here he is wearing the star badge of the 20th Army Corps a little later in the war. At one point, my partner, Mike Whiney, got a letter from a dentist in Florida, who was an avid collect collector of handguns. And this fellow told Mike that he had a Colt Navy revolver, model 1861, with Byron Johnson's name engraved on the back strap. And Mike notified me of this and also informed me that he thought that this fellow was asking too much money for the, for the pistol. And so I decided not to, to purchase it, taking Mike's advice that it was overpriced. And of course, I kicked myself thereafter for letting this go by. It was the first revolver identified to a member of the 154th New York that we were aware of, that we had ever heard of. Well, a few years passed and eventually the handgun wound up in the possession of my friend Pat Cullen of Cattaraugus, New York, who's an avid collector of weapons and other historical 
memorabilia. And eventually I was able to talk Pat Cullen into departing with his 154th New York Treasures. And the Colt Navy Revolver Model 1861 came into my hands. There's the engraving on the back strap. By Renee Johnson, 154th NYSV. Well, fast forward a few years. The same dentist in Florida notifies Mike Whiney that now he's got a revolver that belonged to Patrick Henry Jones, Colonel of the 154th New York, and somebody I was particularly interested in because he became Brigadier General Patrick Henry Jones toward the end of the war. He commanded the brigade to which the 154th New York belonged for much of the Atlanta campaign, the march to the sea, and after he was absent sick for a good portion of the Carolinas campaign, took command again of the brigade at the end of that campaign and at the end of the war and in the Grand Review. Well, this time I didn't hesitate. I emptied my bank account to purchase Patrick Henry Jones's police, Colt police revolver. It's a Model 1862. It's a five shot caliber 36, much lighter, more delicate than the Colt Navy of Captain Johnston. And here's the engraved back strap of that gun. P.H. Jones, 154th New York Volunteers. So, these are the only two identified handguns of members, officers of the 154th New York that I've ever encountered. And I've had the good fortune to, to uh, obtain both of them. Jones became of great interest to me. He always had been. And I had the good fortune to uh, publish a book, a biography of General Jones, which came out in 2015. A lot of it uh, had to do with his post-war career as one of the best known Irish Americans of his day. He was one of only 12 Irishmen, native Irishmen to become Union Civil War generals. And he had an interesting career in post-war New York City as a politician. As a matter of fact, I had posed for the author's photo of the Hardtack Regiment, my first book, at General Jones's headstone in St. Peter's Cemetery, Port Richmond, Staten Island. This photo was taken in May of 1979. So when my Jones biography was in the works, I decided to go back to St. Peter's and pose again with General Jones's headstone for the uh, dust jacket of that book. Now, my next adventure concerns an old friend of mine, Phil Palin. That's Phil on the left. Phil's an avid historical researcher and uh, works with and for the Gowanda Area Historical Society. Gowanda is a village that straddles Cattaraugus Creek. Part of it's in Cattaraugus County, the other part's in Erie County, New York. And Phil and I are posing here in 1995 on the steps of the Cattaraugus County Memorial and Historical Building. The sign above the door says, to the memory of its soldiers and sailors in the War of the Rebellion, this building is erected by Cattaraugus County. It's the most important Civil War memorial in Cattaraugus County. And here I'm just gonna take a little sidetrack to sum up what has happened recently with the Memorial Building, which is in the year 2013, the county having moved the museum out of it in 2004, the county decided in 2013 to tear it down. 
And I mobilized the 154th descendants and they flooded the county legislature with letters and emails of protest. So they put their plans on hold and eventually a group was formed, Citizens Advocating Memorial Preservation, CAMP for short. And CAMP eventually was able to buy the Civil War Memorial from Cattaraugus County. And we are now attempting to restore it. We're in the process of restoring it. We put on a new roof last year. We still have a long way to go. So I would urge you people interested in Civil War preservation history to visit our website at catcomemorial.com. That is C-A-T-T-C-O memorial.com and find out what we're about and see if you can help us out. This has been a big part of my life recently is working for camp. So my friend Phil Palin is on a jaunt over to Ohio and he's visiting a flea market in Ohio and he made a very interesting discovery there. Now here is one of the relics of my grand, great grandfather that our family had preserved. This is a copy of the September 25th, 1929 issue of the Ellicottville Post, their hometown newspaper with the obituary of my great grandfather. The headline reads, John Longhans, Civil War veteran dies, was Corporal in Old 154th and marched with Schreeman to the sea. They spelled General Sherman's name wrong. Well, I got an email from Phil Palin saying, Mark, I was just at this flea market in Ohio and, and you'll never guess what I found. A framed photograph of your great grandfather's obituary. Bought it for 35 bucks. And I wrote back to Phil and I said, golly, it must have been a family member or a good friend who would have gone to the trouble of framing my great grandfather's obituary. Phil replied, nope, the woman I bought it from just had this old frame and she wanted something old to put in it. And she happened to have a copy of this very obscure Western New York rural weekly newspaper and saw the headline about the Civil War veteran and the picture and decided, oh, that'll be something good to put in there. And she cut it out and put it in there. Now, what are the chances of this, these occurrences happening in turn? The woman having the obituary, putting it in the frame, selling it at a flea market where my friend Phil Palin happens to be visiting from a long distance away to encounter it, buy it, and in turn, sell it to me at cost. Yeah. It, together with Kitty Reeler's picture of the veterans at their monument, are hanging one atop the other here in my office, on my office walls. My next adventure happened when I published an article in the Arlington Historical Magazine in October 1994. And the article was Camp Seward on Arlington Heights, a Yankee regiment's first stop in Dixie. At this point, I had quite a few letters describing this first camp that the regiment had. Uh, on Arlington Heights across the Potomac River from Washington. And I thought it would make an interesting article. And I had an illustration for it. This print, this engraving of Camp Seward, the regiment's camp, which was named after Secretary of State William H. Stewart. And the uh, I had discovered this print in the Library of Congress and obtained a reproduction of it from them. And when my article came out, I started wondering, 
is it possible for me to go to someone who deals in ephemera and make a, a request like you would a, sending a want list to a uh, used book seller? This, of course, is in the pre, pre Google days. Uh, and we just happened to have a person that dealt in material like this. And so on a Saturday, I went to this fellow's shop and showed him this picture. And I said, could you keep your eye out and let me know if you ever come across one of these prints? He said, sure, I'll be happy to do that. Well, two days later, the following Monday, totally unrelated to my conversation with the dealer in ephemera, I got an email from a antiques dealer in California who happened to have a Camp Seward print for sale. I was flabbergasted. And of course I purchased it. But what makes this one special is its identification. Here's a close up of it. Now it's beat up, it's foxed, but you can see there's some ins inscriptions on it. This particular example of the Rosenthal engraving of the 154th camp, Camp Seward, was sent home by 15 year old private DeVillo Wheeler of Company I to his father, William Wheeler, in Allegheny, New York. Annotations made by DeVillo on the front include, this is the position of our camp. This is Fort Richardson. This is Company I. And DeVillo Wheeler to William H. Wheeler. And on the back of the print, DeVillo wrote, presented to William H. Wheeler by DeVillo, and this line, Old Allegheny is the place for me. He had only been away from home for a couple of weeks and 15 year old DeVillo Wheeler was homesick. DeVillo was captured at Gettysburg and died as a prisoner of war at Richmond, Virginia. He's buried as an unknown in the Richmond National Cemetery. His grandnephew, Ed Havers of Olean, New York, arranged for the Veterans Administration to provide a marker for DeVillo in his hometown's Allegheny Cemetery. It was dedicated on June 30, 2012. I was honored to deliver the main address in which I quoted from DeVillo's letters home, which I had found in the, the, the Wheeler pension file in the National Archives. This picture shows Ed and his wife, Mary Havers, and me on that day. And of course, I had DeVillo's Camp Seward print with me to show to the, the folks that were there for that ceremony. Here's a Camp Seward print I obtained years after the Wheeler example. This one had been cut down to fit into the frame. There's no inscriptions. So while I'm, I appreciate having it, it has nowhere near the meaning to me that the identified DeVillo Wheeler print has. Now I've already given a talk for the Civil War Roundtable Congress on my second book, Gettysburg's Unknown Soldier which was published by Prager in 1999 and tells the story of Sergeant Amos Thomason, who was killed at Gettysburg and identified by means of the amber type photograph of his three children that he held in his hand. And I had many, many adventures in the course of researching and writing this book. But it was years after the book was published <clears throat> that another adventurous ensued. 
And that's when I received this email on January 11th, 2009. Dear Mark, I am a filmmaker and been writing for the New York Times about photography. I read your book, Gettysburg's Unknown Soldier, this weekend. The book is extraordinarily interesting and deeply moving. I am interested in the parallel stories of how Humiston's identity was revealed and your amazing efforts to uncover the story about the man himself. Is it possible that we could talk in the next couple of days or so? Regards, Errol Morris. Okay, a filmmaker. Hmm. So I, we happen to have, at this time, 2009, we still had a great video rental store in our neighborhood. And I went there and I discovered Errol Morris was the filmmaker who made the Academy Award winning documentary, The Fog of War about Robert McNamara and a number of other films. And so I went on a little Errol Morris film festival binge and watched Errol's work and got back to Errol and told him I'd be happy to talk to him. It turns out that Errol had learned about my book in this book, Drew Gilpin Faust's This Republic of Suffering, Death in the American Civil War, which mentioned the Humiston story and included a, a picture uh, of Amos that had been published in one of the illustrated weekly newspapers of the Civil War era. Well, Errol and I had many conversations and Errol eventually wrote a five part essay about the Humiston story and how I came to write it that was published in the online edition of the New York Times and subsequently was pu published as the last chapter of his book, Believing a Seeing, Observations on the Mysteries of Photography. So I got to know Errol Morris. I've only met him a couple of times, once at his office in Cambridge and another time when he was giving a talk at the Brattle Theater in Cambridge. This picture was taken on November 30th, 2012, when he was talking about believing is seeing. And Errol bought the film rights to my book, Gettysburg's Unknown Soldier, but he never renewed the the rights. And I think he put the project on the back shelf, which of course is a disappointment to me, but I still believe that Errol might have in the back of his mind, the idea of making a Humiston movie. He uh, had some very specific ideas about how he wanted to go about it, but Errol's a mercurial guy and it's hard to tell where he's gonna wind up next. In the meantime, well, he wrote this forward for the paperback version of my book, which was very nice of him. Uh, this was published in 2012. There's been one depiction of Amos Humiston in film, and that was the Tony Scott and Ridley Scott produced Gettysburg, which was done for the History Channel. It told the story of the Battle of Gettysburg through the experiences of eight soldiers from both North and South. One of them was Amos Humiston, and it drew on my book. But I must say, <clears throat> I'm still waiting for an Errol Morris film to come. And if you would like to see a great Humiston movie, I would suggest you go to Errol Morris's website, errolmorris.com, and drop him a line and say, hey, make that Humiston movie. Now we're back to one of the relics that my great grandfather saved from the Civil War. And our family story said that these three cotton balls he had picked during Sherman's March to the Sea. And they are obviously one of the more unusual relics that our family preserved. We always talked about the cotton balls as the 
item of interest, but to me, I'm also fascinated by this box. Where did the box come from? These cotton balls had always been in the box from as far back as my dad and my aunt could remember. So it seemed likely that Grandpa Longhans probably came across this box about the same time he came across the cotton balls, found it a handy, handy place to put these cotton balls in and carry them back home. I started really thinking about this as a new book was developing in my mind. And that was my 2012 book, Marching with Sherman through Georgia and the Carolinas with the 154th New York. And one of my goals in this book was to collect Southern equivalents of my family stories and relics of John Longhans. I made a trip, a research trip in 2007 and followed the route of the regiment. Here's a portion of it in a map from my book. Uh, this is from Milledgeville, which was the state capital of Georgia during the Civil War, to Savannah. And outside of Sandersville, Georgia, is Forest Grove Farm, Forest Grove Plantation during the Civil War years, <clears throat> which was one place I encountered during my research trip. I kept a journal during that trip, which I illustrated occasionally with drawings of places I came upon. Here's my drawing of the so-called big house at Forest Grove Plantation. As my caption state, states, it was built by Thomas Jefferson Worthen who during the Civil War became Colonel of the 28th Georgia Infantry Regiment. And he was mortally wounded at Malvern Hill. And when I stopped on January 26, 2007 at Forest Grove, I met the occupants, Lyle, and Sarah Lansdell, a mother and daughter team. And they had stories to share with me. Here is Colonel Thomas Jefferson Warthen of the 28th Georgia, mortally wounded at Malvern Hill. His wife, Sarah Wicker Warthen. According to a family story, a faithful slave accompanied Colonel Warthen's remains from Virginia back down to Georgia to Forest Grove outside of Sandersville, where they were laid to rest in the family cemetery. Here's his monument. Here's Sarah Wicker Warthen's headstone. Right next to the house, right across the driveway from the house. Here's Lyle Lansdell with relics of Colonel Warthern in Sandersville Brown House Museum. This was in 2013 when I paid a visit after my book was published. Lyle arranged for me to speak down there. And here's Forest Grove, the big house as it looks today. Now, according to family stories, widow Sarah Wicker Warthern Several daughters and about 50 slaves were present at Forest Grove when the Yankees came. A captain told Sarah to evacuate the house. It was going to be burned. She refused. With that, the bummers, mostly Germans, according to their family legend, stripped the dining room of its silverware, drenched the carpets with syrup, torched the outbuildings and cotton bales, and forced the slaves to depart with them leaving small black children clinging to Mrs. Warthern in tears. Here's another view of Forest Grove. Some items were saved from being destroyed by Sherman's vandals. The late Colonel's sword was buried in a creek bed. 
and escape detection. Here's Lyle in 2013 and her mom, Sarah. One of the Worthen girls slipped this teaspoon into her pocket, keeping it safe from the thieving Yankees. According to a family story, faithful slaves loaded the family piano onto a wagon and drove it around back war roads until the Yankees left. So with the Lansdells at Forest Grove, I had found one of many legacies of the war of Sherman's March to the Sea among the Georgians and Carolinians that I discovered in my research, but this one seemed extra special to me and this story in particular. This glass dome contains artificial flowers and hair art made out of human hair. And when the Yankees came to Forest Grove, one of them picked up this glass dome and was about to smash it. When the Worthen girl who made it begged him not to, whereupon he gently put it down on the floor, according to the family story. It's been on the Forest Grove mantle ever since. In the Lansdale stories and in this artifact in particular, I found the Southern mirror of my family's stories in our box of cotton balls. My last adventure is the most recent. Among the items handed down in our family was this carte de visite photograph of Grandpa Longhans, Corporal John Longhans, 154th New York, photographed by Bellin Brother of 480 Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, DC, no doubt at the close of the war. On February 10th, 2016, my friend Kyle Stetz of Virginia, a native of Cattaraugus County, informed me that a sixth plate tintype of my great grandfather was up for bids on eBay. He was posing with another soldier. There was no doubt it was him. He was wearing the same clothes. Although in the tintype, because of the mirror image effect of those types of photographs, it was all reversed but it was up for bids on eBay. And I put in a bid, which brought the high bid to $45. And I spent a very anxious week waiting for someone to outbid me. And as the end of the auction approached on February 17th, I put in an insanely high bid to make sure that no one would outbid me at the last minute. But when the digital hammer fell, I still had the high bid at $45, which is darn cheap to get a photograph of your ancestor. Of course, the question is, who is great grandpa Longhans posing with here, rather affectionately with his hand on his shoulder? I call this individual Bandage Thumb. Who is Bandage Thumb? Well, perhaps I'll have another great adventure and learn exactly who he is. Thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed my adventures. There's always more to come.